greetings in Jesus' name and welcome everybody to tonight's engagement. Um, it is such a privilege to have you all uh, present here this evening on this call, spontaneous call, to meet in this fashion. Uh, welcome to members of the House, Gate Ministries, Durban Central, as well as to, um, I see some other members of our broader house that we father, also present from other nations, one or two pastors as well. I'm going to uh, not fall prey to the temptation to mention you by name, uh, just in the event that I leave somebody out, as I cannot peruse the screens here present to see who exactly is here. Um, and so please forgive me, but please know that all of you are indeed extremely welcome to tonight's engagement. Um, tonight is a very special call to everybody to come to this specific meeting to prosecute, um, to ponder over, and to give attention and consideration to um, some issues that Pastor Thamo Naidu, who is our apostolic fatherly oversight, to whom we are submitted and to whom we relate, to give attention to issues that he has been uh, speaking on prophetically. In recent weeks, he has been speaking on the topic of the Amorite spirit. I felt impressed of the Lord to do this kind of summation of some of the broader concepts that he has been touching on in his deliberation as he has gone through the series up to this point in time. As, if, as indicated, he has covered um, eight sessions today. The series is not yet complete, and it still proceeds into the next few weeks. I want to encourage all who are on the call, if you have not already, to track this series by listening to his teachings on the Gate Ministry Santon YouTube channel. And you can search for it. This video will be posted to our YouTube channel as well. And in the description of the video, I will post links, specific links, to these sessions that Pastor Thamo um, is currently doing. But before we proceed, perhaps let's just pause for a, a word of prayer. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We ask, oh God, even as we engage your mind and your demand upon us, as a local house, as a broader house, for the time in which we live, that we would gain understanding. I thank you, Father, for the spirit of revelation. Thank you for the spirit of understanding that would be our portion. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I submit every heart and mind to you, and I pray, O oh God, that you will cause us to excel in the knowledge and in clearly, not just understanding, but internalizing, and then help us to incarnate and give flesh to the things that we will hear. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Amen. Well, we have close to 70, I think, devices uh, present. And once again, a warm welcome um, to, to one and all. And please excuse me, there's been a lot of warfare around the session today. Uh, I'm speaking right now with an absolutely throbbing headache, um, but uh, we will push through and ensure that the will of the Lord is fully and completely accomplished. I prepared a PowerPoint presentation in which I will go through just to make our time together a bit more easily facilitated. Uh, now, obviously, we cannot do justice in one hour to discussing 
eight sessions of work that Pastor Thamo has done. So all I'm going to do in this session tonight is to give you a broad overarching view of some of the most pertinent aspects of what he has been teaching on. This teaching came through him from the Lord as a prophetic imperative. And I want everybody to clearly understand this. It's not just another teaching that we want you to be familiar with. It's a now word. It's a current demand. If you want to know what God is currently saying to us in the Gate Global community, then this is it. So we, we attune our ears to what our apostolic father is teaching and he's saying, and we want to understand and then engage the teaching and then actualize, incarnate it within our personal lives. So the teaching that um, he has been focusing on has is entitled or titled Overcoming the Amorite Spirit. I need to say this as we begin. The reference to the word spirit here has got not so much to do with an evil spirit as much as it has to do with a mindset or an internal attitude or a disposition within one, a way of thinking, uh, a mentality, if you would. So my reference to a spirit or the Amorite spirit throughout this discourse, uh, when you hear it, you think mindset, you think attitude, you think disposition. Okay, this is going to be very important for you to understand. Obviously, evil spirits uh, are at the bedrock behind these kinds of attitudes or mentalities. I'm not discounting that, but please, for the purposes of our understanding and discussion here, the reference to this, the term spirit here has reference to a mentality, a mindset an attitude, okay? So this is a brief overview of the first eight sessions. I don't have time to go into the finer details, but with broad strokes, I'm going to give you sort of the outline and then perhaps zone in on one or two things. Also, for anyone that has been, is listening to this and you have been tracking the eight series, this presentation is given from my point of view as I listened and, and as I encoded, you might listen to the same set of eight sessions, and come away with a different summation. But I'm speaking as, as I hear and as I see structurally and as I perceive prophetically the demand of the Lord for us here at Gate Ministries, Durban Central, and indeed everyone that is in some respect affiliated to our ministry. Now, obviously, uh, Pastor Thamunaidu, for those of you who don't know him, is the lead elder and founder of Gate Ministries Santon in the city of Santon, Gauteng, South Africa. And he's our apostolic covering. He's the individual that we have voluntarily submitted our lives and our ministry to. So we track his doctrine. We track his teaching for it's through teaching and doctrine that he essentially provides fathering. You are encouraged to search for Gate Ministry Santon on your YouTube channel and subscribe to this specific channel so that you can receive notifications of ongoing sessions in the same and other topics that he will prosecute. Now, let's get into it. And I want to encourage you really just have an open heart this evening and have an open mind to receive the things that God would say to you. Now, first off, you must understand this fact, that Israel's wilderness journeys um, is over a 40-year period. But that 40-year period is in two parts. So when they left Egypt en route to the Promised Land, which were they meant to possess, it took them 40 years. But this 40-year segment is divided up into two distinct parts. 
there's the first 38 years, right? And then there is a, another two-year period. Now, in after the 38 years and in the two-year period, Moses would rehearse the law of the Lord to Israel. Remember, the Lord was given to them at Sinai or Mount Horeb. I think it was a few days after they came up out of Egypt. God's law, God's principles were given to them. Now, 38 years later, Moses finds the need to teach the law again. And you'll find this in the book of Deuteronomy. For the purposes of our discussion here, the biblical basis for everything we are saying in this evening session is found in Deuteronomy chapters 1, 2, and 3. The word Deuteronomy, the book, the word Deuteronomy means the law again, or the law the second time. Deuter means again, or to repeat, or twice. So the first part of Deuteronomy, Deuter, Deut, Deuter means again or repeat. Ronomi, from the root nomos, means law. So Deuteronomy means the law again, the law the second time. The first time the law was given was when they came up out of Egypt. They were delivered as slaves from Egyptian captivity. There the law was given, and then they would traverse through the wilderness for 38 years under Moses' leadership. Um, before they are about now to enter and possess the promised land, the law is given to them a second time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. It's the second hearing that produces faith. But now the law is going to be repeated not to a people that have just come out of slavery. Now the law is going to be repeated to a people with a different mindset that are about to go into conquer or enter the promise of God, their so-called promised land. So you must understand this two-phase position. Right now, at least in the South African context, what is known as the apostolic season in this year, September this year, would be 30 years old. From 1994 to 2024, we in the apostolic have come through a 30-year period. 30, as you know, is the number of maturity, right? It's the number of maturity. And it seems as though we've been journeying, we've been journeying through a developmental stage of God's dealings with us. Now we are on the precipice of entering into possession of inheritances, um, the realization of promises for all that God has promised us individually and as a corporate local church. But you cannot enter into possession until you are prepared. So, for example, these 38 years in Israel's context could be seen as God preparing his people. But also in the two years is also a phase of preparation. But it's two phases of preparation for possession. But the, the character of the preparation in each phase is distinctly different. In the first phase, God had to deal with the nation, prune them, um, extract uh, systems of unbelief, doubt, carnality, and the like. And in the, again, in the next two years, he will do something very similar, but now with a new generation that is that hasn't just come out of enslavement. The slave mindset has been dealt with. This generation now in these two years are going to now possess the land, okay? So there's two key principles or concepts that you must factor into your mind. The one is formation for function. God will never allow you to function until he has first formed you. So you must be formed before you can do. God has got to shape you 
before you can allow or use you to any significant degree. And the, the global church has gone through great formation in the apostolic season, at least in our context. The other sort of phrase you must keep in mind is position for, for privilege. God will position you before he allows you to enter into certain privilege. So don't discount or underestimate God's formation processes or God's positioning processes. The formation is for function and the position is for privilege. These two concepts will come through a lot in tonight's discussion. So now I want to delve deeply into some of the principles highlighted from Pastor Thamo in his series. This first 38 years took place between two positions, he taught, right? The two positions are, the first is Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb equates to Mount Sinai, where the law was given. Here Moses received revelation from heaven, laws, statutes, principles, governing life, governing how Israel should behave was received at Mount Horeb. There was the download of revelation or the transmission of, of revelation. We in the apostolic have received such great revelation over the years. And every theme taught, every topic considered was for our sequential, methodical, chronological building up toward forming a certain quality of son of God in every single one of us, right? The other extreme position is a place called Kadesh Barnia. Kadesh from the root Kodosh, which means holy. So this place, Kadesh Barnia, can be sort of summarized as a place of holiness. So God wants to get his people from Horeb, where laws are downloaded, to a place called Kadesh Barnia, where holiness is exemplified. The word holy here, holy, literally means ineffable. The word ineffable means incomparable. Nothing to compare with. It's absolutely distinct. When you say God is holy, what you are saying there's no opposite. There's no comp comp comparative to him. Is ineffable. Is absolutely distinct. Yes, for us in our context, it would include being separate. When you are separate, you are distinct, right? You are set apart for divine use. Now, we we have to come into our distinction as a church, our separateness, where. People look at us and say, these are distinctly holy. They are distinctly the children of God. Now, you, can't, you cannot get to Kadesh Barnia until you have encountered Horeb. So Horeb is where the, 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 the word, if you would, is downloaded. And they journey in these 38 years on a process in which they must now incarnate the principles in behavior and in attitude until the world can say these people are holy, these people are distinctly different from what we see in the earth. These people are distinctly God. And what I want to encourage you is don't discount God's formation processes. God is getting you to a place. God is working on you to make you distinct, set apart, vastly different from others. So the, the principles installed at Horeb must be activated now in a place called Kadesh Barnia, a distinct place, a place of holiness. Okay. Now I need to, before we proceed, just give some explanation as to the Jordan River. The Jordan River, as you know, is that river that they would cross before going into possessing the land. The river, the name, literally means rapidly descending. 
it's not simply to descend, it's to rapidly descend or to quickly descend, to descend with speed. What I'm asking you, if you're on this call, your levels of obedience must be quick, must be rapid. Your levels of compliance, you've got no time to waste. You've got no time to negotiate and to deliberate. It has to be reflexive and almost immediate. Okay? So unless you cross your Jordan, you will never possess your promised land. And, you know, the whole idea of descent or descending denotes humility, to lower oneself. It's opposite to pride, to being obstinate, to being rebellious. It's compliance to God's laws, right? Pastor Thamo said it represents total death or descent, the lowest part. You must become a person of no reputation, where you don't live unto upholding a name for yourself in the eyes of those closest to you or the world. You are prepared to lose everything simply to obey God. So it also in incorporates blind obedience to God's word, blind obedience to the word of the Lord, okay? Where we obey reflexively. So listen very, very carefully. Israel, at the end of the 40-year period, would cross the Jordan. God wants to get them to this place of deep humility. God wants to get them to this place of total death, lowest point, becoming of no reputation, blind obedience to, to God's word. And we all need to get here if you're going to go in, go up, and possess the land that God has given you. Your prophetic destiny must be attained. It will not be attained without crossing your Jordan, but before you cross your Jordan, there's a process even to get to the Jordan. And this is where I just want to pick this up. I said to you, just to go back here, I said to you that there are two phases, right? There's this 38-year period, and then there's this two-year period. Moses brings them 38 years across the wilderness, and he is now going to have a very different experience with Israel, leading them in these two years. In these two years, they're going to have to deal with a significant enemy called the Amorite. But even before they deal with the Amorite, you, you got to see this, you got to see the broad structure here. We are, we being brought out of Egypt, journeyed for 38 years. These next two years are going to be quite strategic, quite pivotal, quite important. It's going to lead us at the end of the two years to cross our Jordan, which we must then to go and possess the land. But for us to get to the Jordan in these two years, God is going to cause us to go along a certain path. Okay. Now, before you cross your Jordan, you're going to cross three smaller rivers to get there. So it's not, you know, we often grow up in Sunday school and we would say, oh, they crossed the Jordan and they went up to possess the land, etc. after that. But there are three rivers to cross before you get to cross the Jordan. And these rivers are the Zared, the Anan, and the Jabok. Right? Let's go through each of these very quickly because their names are quite significant. Right? First, the Zared. The Zared, the Zared River, the word Zared means luxuriant growth of trees, exuberant growth, or thick foliage, thick foliage. Right? You look at the words there, luxuriant, exuberant. Look at the words growth. Look at the words tree. Look at the words thick foliage. This is a picture of success. I want to tell everybody without contradiction, God wants you successful. You've got to be successful in life. God wants you to be, to grow luxuriantly, exuberantly. Don't shy away from this. This river you must cross. So this river, the Zared, also means the stranger is subdued or the bond is subdued, right? 
Um, it could mean many things, and you must wait on the Lord as to how He will speak to you regarding these this, the, these meanings. But the bond is anything that holds you in bondage; it's overcome. The bond subdued. Anything that limits, anything that stifles. I know some of you are thinking about your own literal house bond here, but it could be literally anything that prevents the full expression of success, growth, etc. So we, we, whenever you think of the Zared, you've got to cross it to experience exuberant growth. So prophetically, if you look at Israel, they did not attack Jericho. Jericho would be the first city they would attack when they would possess the land. They would attack it having already crossed the Zered. In other words, they would have come into a place of, of, of lush, thick foliage. When you see them, these are not poor people. These are not frail people. These are strong. They have every trapping of success known to their world in their day. And I want to encourage you all, pursue success. It's godly. It's not ungodly to be successful, even to prosper materially. I'll talk to more to that in a moment. The next river they had to cross was the Arnon. And the Arnon was a rushing river. The name Arnon means murmuring or roaring, not the negative murmur as in uh, complaint. Um, it, it speaks to, if you look at other dictionaries, to a torrent or tumultuous, uh, noisy stream. So the Arnon was a gushing river, a sounding torrent. Right, and it alludes to, in Pastor Thalmo's language, crisis or suffering, private wars, hidden issues. Now, all of us had our fair share of suffering and crisis over the past years. Know this God is forming you for function, know this God is preparing you for something. No level of suffering is without significance in God's economy. God will bring hidden issues to the fore as he excavates your heart in allowing the things he has permitted to come your way. God will unearth things and you must embrace suffering. You must cross your rushing river. Seem that it might drown you, but it won't. Seems like a torrent, but it will not cover you. Pastor Thomas said, crisis determines whether you are a root or a reed. A root is not dislodged. A reed is easily dislodged. You see, before you go up, go in, possess the land, attack your Jericho, God would by then would have had to have tested you in significant suffering. So I want you to embrace your Zared, to embrace the whole idea of success, good success, as Joshua 1.8 would call it. Also embrace your Arnon, cross your Arnon. Just come to terms with the fact that suffering is part of your process, but learn the lessons and learn it well and become strong. No weak Israel is going to attack Jericho and the rest of the lands to conquer them. God would have made them strong through a process of suffering designed to build steel and fortitude within them. I want to say this to all of you. God is doing the same to you. So cross your Zared, cross your Arnon, and then cross your Jabbok. The third river they crossed before crossing the Jordan was the Jabbok. Jabbok means emptying or pouring out running out a river, right? Um, so the Jabbok, the key word here, if you remember what the Jabbok means, the key word is to empty out. God wants to empty you out of you. God wants to empty you out of your own carnality, own selfish ambition, own self-preservation. Unless you cross your Jabbok, you're not going to enter your promised land eventually. So you've got to become a man or a woman of no reputation. Do not live for yourself. Your status is son. 
but your choice is servant. And as a servant, you say to God, your master, I die to myself. I die to personal preference. I am your son, but I choose to empty myself out of my own will, own ambitions, own inclinations, in deference for serving your purposes fully. Now, remember, um, Pastor Thamo briefly referenced Jacob in his teaching because Jacob had to cross this river, right? Remember when he left Uncle Laban's house and he was going back to Bethel? Before he arrived there, Esau, his twin brother that he deceived out of his birthright, was waiting for him and wanting to kill him. So Jacob wrestled with the angel on the mount. And when he came down to confront um, Esau, he crossed this Jabbok ford or river. So as he would cross it, he was literally emptying himself out of his own deception, his deceptive character. And I want to encourage you to deal with your past, because Jacob had to deal with an outstanding past issue that was not yet resolved. You see, all of these things, God prophetically is dealing with the nation of Israel as they prepare to go up, go in and possess, <coughs> excuse me, the land that God has promised them. I want to pause here to say this very strongly to you. Deal with outstanding matters before you proceed. Cross your jabbok. Resolve the issue so you can go forward to possess the land. Right? Now, <clears throat> they would cross these three rivers and they would confront an enemy before possessing the promised land. The enemy was the Amorite nation. Now, the Amorite means the following. The word means mountaineer, a talker, or a sayer. The word also means a slayer, one who destroys. Let's quickly go through some of the prophetic implications of this before we actually discuss it in detail. Right? So the Amorite, that's the meaning strictly from the Bible dictionary. And here are some of Pastor Thamo's thoughts. So the Amorite nation lives in a mountain. So they are mountaineers. They are people of elevation because they want to assume dominance over everyone beneath them. They're dictatorial, authoritarian. They are, they look down on people, as it were, full with pride. Okay. So they love the ascended positions, love the high places, right? Um, they profile themselves very, very well to gain ascendancy or, 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 or work their way into positions of leadership by which they can manipulate and control others. This can be expressed in church context, in the workplace or the marketplace, even in family arrangements. This mentality, this spirit, this mindset persists. They are also called Westerners, right? And a lot of, you'll see in a moment, a lot of the the, 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 the ideology of the Amorites literally emanate from the West, places like North America and some parts of Europe as well, right? Amorites publicly profile themselves, right? There's no recessive or, 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 or background position. They're in the foreground, in your face, wanting to push an agenda. Please track with me. I know I'm going a bit fast, but time is of the essence. They say to slay. The word Amorite means a talker, a sayer. It also means a slayer. So they say to slay. They dominate through speech. When they use words, they convey ideas, concepts, uh, mentalities, they proliferate it through media, social media, and, and for example, news networks, and, and other means. They're very good at disseminating information or communication because they want to slay through words, establish 
a foothold or a stronghold in the minds of men through content, speech. Now, for example, remember the negative report of the 10 spies? They said, we cannot go up, go in and possess the land, right? Do you know, by the way, this was 11 days after, 11 days after leaving Egypt, they went to spy the land uh, in the south, Hebron. Do you know which nations occupy that? The Amorites. The Amorites were living there, and they were giants. They were literal giants. The Amorites were living there. So Israel encountered the spirit after 11 days, and they were obviously intimidated to, to the degree where the report of the 10 spies actually was negative. And you know the account when the 10 spies came back and say, we cannot go up, go in and possess the land, right? Because we are like grasshoppers in their sight. That, that negative report killed the spirit of faith in the whole nation because they, could, they didn't understand who they were. And we got you on your, on your notes here, understand who you are. When you deal with the Amorite spirit, it's going to attempt to, through neck, the words, to cause you to doubt. Remember way back in the garden, the serpent said to Eve, Didn't, did the Lord God actually say that you will die if you eat of the fruit? It's always a question. It's a negative sayer. And do not underestimate the counsel perhaps that some of you are receiving from the wrong sources. Words slay. They say to slay. They dominate through speech. Be careful of who you open up your spirit to, to receive words or counsel. This is going to be critical in the next season. In the next season. Um, Pastor Thomas spent some time discussing Nimrod. In uh, Nimrod wanted to dominate the world. Um, remember the Tower of Babel? They built uh, the, the city, Babylon. They wanted to build a tower of, uh, that reached the heavens. And God stopped them. How? By confusing their, by confusing their speech. There's always divine intervention when the Amorite spirit through speech wants to dominate a people. God's response is, I confuse the speech because God knows the power of a, 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 a speech that is united. Remember the Tower of Babel, there was so one, God said, they will actually achieve the objective because they are so one. So the way in which God neutralized them was to confuse their speaking. So it's very important you understand the methodology, the modus operandi by which the spirit operates. And don't let it infiltrate or influence your, your persons. So they're focused on ideologies or paradigms, worldviews, prevailing patterns of, of thinking, for example. For example, if today there's an attack on marriage, right? For example, same-sex marriage is gaining ground. The LGBTQ community pushing their agenda, using speech, communication, um, etc. These are ideologies. These are paradigms. These are worldviews, patterns of prevailing thinking. So they will speak to alter the mind of men. Once the mind of men is altered, they change patterns of human behavior, sometimes that are opposed to the will of the Lord, right? So the greatest warfare is not spiritual, but is an ideological warfare. Right now, the church is in an ideological warfare. The battlefield is the mindset, the minds of men, the thinking of men. The Amorites were huge giants. They were literally um, big people. Anak, the Anakites, many of you know the Anak, children of Anak or the Anakites reference in the scriptures. These were Amorites as well. So they're big. Everyone say big. So this is a big push to, for domination. So, and there are many, uh, the question here, what are the popular worldviews today? Who is the ideological giant that we have to conquer? These things we must give consideration to. You must know how the world thinks. This is the warfare that we are confronting. It's an ideological warfare. 
Weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but they are mighty through God, pulling down arguments, imaginations, bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you need to know what you need to dismantle. We mustn't be oblivious. The church mustn't be ignorant as to prevailing ideological paradigm positions in this modern age. Uh, you've got to be familiar with things like modernism, postmodernism, existentialism. Some of these things I'll give attention to in the forthcoming weeks, right? Jeremiah must first uproot, then tear down before he will build and plant and lay foundations. Again, unfortunately, I can't go into the details here, I'm giving you a broad overview, broad over arc. And so just these the past three slides, I want you to understand what you, we are dealing with. We're dealing with the Amorite, ascended high place position, domination, mountaineer. He talks, he communicates through ideology, he wants to, through saying he wants to slay and affect the culture of the world in which we live today, right? Now, three groups of people, you got to be aware of this. This is very important, this next part. There were three groups of people that Israel could not possess, were not allowed to possess, right? The Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. You'll read this in Deuteronomy chapter 2. God says to them very clearly, don't offend these people, don't bother with them, don't antagonize them, pass through their lands. This is, this is not your fight. Their land don't possess, Right? And remember, these are mentalities or mindsets. So quickly, I want to go through this. Before you confront, listen to me very carefully. I'm going to end in a moment by talking about the two Amorite kings. You can't deal with the Amorite kings until you've crossed your, your three rivers, your Zared, your Anon, your Jabbok, right? You can't deal with the Amorite spirit until you go through the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, and you don't possess their mentalities. You don't take their way of thinking with you. Otherwise, you have no authority to deal with the Amorite spirit. You've got you to see the broad over arc and the genius of God in him leading the people. So very quickly, without spending too much time on each one, let's look at these things you cannot cannot be part of your system. These you mustn't possess. These mentalities, you mustn't be in your system. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, as you know. The word Esau means red or sin-like, earth-like, lean upon carnal desires. Whenever you think of Edom or Esau, you think carnality, right? Esau is called a fornicator, right? And I want you to really deal with fornication. Sins of the flesh must be dealt with, all right? Deal with sensuality, unbridled um, sexual ambition or desires must be brought in check to the, to the management of the Holy Spirit in you. Because Esau is called a fornicator. Respect the protocols governing all relationships. That's all I'm asking for. Be pure. Um, be circumspect, be integrous at every level, okay? The Bible says that God hates Esau. You'll find this in the book of Romans. He hated Esau, but he loved Jacob. The reason why he hated Esau, Esau sold what was not his to sell. Remember, he sold his birthright. The birthright belonged to the firstborn. The firstborn belonged to God. So when Esau sold his birthright, he was, not, he was selling what was not his to sell. He despised something very significant, and God hated him for that. He was willing to trade something so significant for a bowl of soup. Again, he is a desire person. His appetite rules his heart. His appetite rules his decisions. His appetite rules his mind. And this you must, you must get the victory over. Pastor Thomas said, you will not function harmonistically, self-preservingly, or with selfish ambition. Okay. 
Do not live for your own ambition or appetite. You, you cannot function in self-preservation or selfish ambition. You cannot live with just pleasing yourself all the time. You can't possess Edom. You can't possess the Edomites or the land of Edom or Esau as a principle. You are forbidden to function outside of your firstborn status. Do not sell birthright. Okay? You are, you know, it should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Esau had firstborn status. But he functioned outside of that firstborn status, and he lost it. So if we're going to rule the Amorite spirit and ultimately possess the land, we cannot possess Edom. We cannot possess the spirit that despises birthright. The next land God said don't even bother with them is the, the Moabites. Moab is the son of Lot by incest. Remember, one of Lot's daughters slept with him and produced Moab. Moab, as you know, means, amongst many things, what father? It is a spirit that discounts the need for fathering. It despises spiritual fathering. It is anti-patriarchy. It is anti-leadership, anti-headship. Now, this spirit you can't take with you. You've got to find a father, a spiritual father, and submit to this individual with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Otherwise, if you attempt to take this Moabite dynamic with you, you're not going to deal with the Amorites successfully, and neither will you possess the land. Okay? The preservation of the function of, of representative fathers is what we must hold dear to. I have much to say about this. We have a large body of teaching available on the subject, but because of time, I'm, I'm going to leave it here. All I'm saying to you is, Recognize your need to have a spiritual father, for someone to watch over your soul, respect and honor this individual, and obey their doctrine fully. The next group that they were not allowed to, to possess was the region of Ammon or the Ammonites. Uh, Ammon or Ben-Ami was the other son born to Lot's other daughter. And the word means great people or son of my people pertaining to the nation, people of strength, tribal, right? So it is, it is like son of my brother, not son of my father. The word means son of my people. Um, it, you see the word people recurs throughout the meanings here. The emphasis is the group, the collective, the corporate, the, the group, right? So the tribe or the tribal, but you're the son of my people. You're not the son of my father. So the, you're the son of my brother, not the son of my father. There's a great emphasis in the spirit on fraternity or brotherhood, the group, without an acknowledgement of patriarchy. A lot of people want fraternity without patriarchy. You cannot have brotherhood without fatherhood. You cannot be listening to brothers for counsel and ignoring, for example, the counsel of a father. This spirit is the root of democracy. Moab kills fathers. The story of Ruth will tell you this. But Ammon elevates fraternity or co-equality. You'll see there in the definition of Ammon, this emphasis on the group, the people, the tribe, but there's no headship. It's like the group, we are all equal. We can all do this together, but there's no singular identifiable leader. Now that's the spirit of democracy. If you follow in global news, democracy is being judged quite significantly in our current time. Okay, can I go into detail here? Remember Absalom? He was not called to be a father, but he coveted David's position as father over the nation. Remember? He planned a coup against his own dad. Now, the Bible says he failed, obviously, but he had sons, natural sons of his own. He had... He had them, but the Bible says he didn't have them. And he had to build a memorial stone in his honor. He had no sons to perpetuate his legacy, even though he had physical sons born. But God did not elect them to, 
to continue generational succession or line of perpetuity. Here is the challenge. If you function and possess the spirit of Ammon, where you elevate fraternity above patriarchy, you will be successful to a degree. You can produce something, but it will not be used by God in the unfolding nature of his purposes generationally down the line. Okay? There is ranking in the midst of co-equality. Right? We believe this strongly. Um, we believe that we are all co-equal as sons of God when we stand before God. But God has put his grace on certain ones to lead, and you've got to respect that. And don't fall prey to the sin of Miriam, who spoke against Moses, or Korah, who also rebelled against Moses. So those three spirits, the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, cannot, um, you cannot possess these, these spirits. Now, as we prepare to close, I want to just zone in on the two Amorite kings, because this is very important. Now, everything I've said is important, because you're going to cross those three rivers, not possess those three nations, right? Before you confront these two Amorite kings, right? And God, this is a now prophetic word. This is a word from God for our church and for everyone on this call. God wants you to, to deal with this ideological giant. And the kings represent these two principalities. There are two kings mentioned in the books of Deuteronomy, chapters 1, 2, and 3, that Moses had to overcome. King Sion of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan. And both kings and their places they rule have specific meaning that you must possess. Now, please, I want everybody to pay attention. This, this whole teaching is very important. This whole series, this whole theme that Pastor Tham is focus on, focusing on is quite significant in terms of its preparation for us for the next season. Look at this first king, King Sion of Heshbon. Right? Sion means sweeping away, a general who drives everything before him. Rush, great. Right? Self-possession. You have this idea of someone just like bulldozing, sweeping over everything in front of you. Very powerful king. But they defeated him. The place he ruled was Heshbon, which means a place of scheming, reasoning, a device, counting and account. Now, you please, you've got to understand this. Uh, before I, I, I put that up, listen to this. Think of what Heshbon means, scheming. So Heshbon is a place of planning. The word strategy is key. I should have put it up on the screen. You should write this down if you're taking notes. Although I'll share these slides with everyone on this call at your request. Strategy, scheming, having a system or a way of doing things. This is what Heshbon, King Sion rules Heshbon. The city he rules is a place of scheming, strategy working out a system for domination. And God wants you to possess this. God wants us to overcome this. So we're going to take this mentality and we're going to imbibe it in our system. We're going to be the ones sweeping away, overcoming. We're going to be the ones where we have a scheme because we have strategized. So I want you to go back to your drawing board, even after this meeting. And think of your whole life. For us as a church, we need to do this corporately. Think of what, if God has plans and purposes for my life, what is my scheme? What is my system that I'm going to use to get the result? Because you can have great prophecies, but without a strategy, you're not going to get anywhere. And God wants you to possess King Sion of Heshbon. God wants you to become a strategist. And may the wisdom of God be your portion. Pastor Thomas said in the next few weeks, he'll go into this whole issue of wisdom. But there's divine intelligence that God wants to give you 
You see, you can have a great prophecy. It's not just going to happen. God's going to give you a scheme, a way of getting to that result. What Thomas said, the church must upskill itself in the way it thinks, analyzes, dissects, creates environments in which it preserves its own dominant worldviews shaped by the word of God. You see, the Amorite has its own ideology, worldviews, but we too have ours. But our systems, our methodologies, the way in which we work must now be given greater scrutiny so that we can proceed into the next, let's say, two years with a strategy in mind and we can get outcomes. And I pray this grace would be your portion tonight. I really believe there's grace for this. Take all your prophecies and start to develop a system. There's great favor that God is bringing to us in this respect, right? Deuteronomy 2.31 says, The Lord said to me, See, I've begun to deliver Sion and his land over to you, Heshbon. Begin to occupy that you might possess his Heshbon. His place of scheming, of strategizing, is now going to become yours. If you have a business that you are running, start to strategize. The capacity to scheme. I'm not, I'm not speaking conni conniving now or deceptively, uh, deceptive uh, uh, methodologies. I'm talking Holy Ghost-infused wisdom that will be your portion. For, for, for our local church, every person involved in every, any department, whatever, wherever you're functioning, think of your department and think of how best can we now work a system of working more efficiently, more effectively. We have to take this king. The second king, and I'm going to end with this, is King Og of Bashan. Now, Moses overran King Sion of Heshbon. And then God said to him, now the next king you must take. These two kings, quite significant Amorite principalities. Og of Bashan. Og means long neck. So he's a picture of pride, stubbornness. He's obstinate. Right? He's obstinate and confident. Picture him, eh? Long, giant, long neck, pride. Uh, he wore a massive gold chain, they say, around his neck. And this was a very clear picture of prosperity. Now, you got to possess this. Without the pride, though, without the obstinance, you got to decapitate, cut him off by his neck but possess his prosperity, right? Because the place he ruled, Bashan, means fruitfulness, right? King Sion, the one who sweeps over, ruled Heshbon. Heshbon means a place of scheming, reckoning, accounting. But King Og, this long neck with a gold chain around his neck, symbol of prosperity, ruled Bashan, which means fruitfulness. Now, I want to say this to you. Like I said this to you, when you crossed your Zared, you came into luxuriant, exuberant growth. Before you cross the Jordan and possess the land, you got to be fruitful. Right? You got to be fruitful. You got to be prosperous. The time for poverty is over. Honest, only very clear about this. I'll release a, a set of teachings soon in reference to this. God wants his church prosperous. Now, we are not pushing a so-called prosperity gospel as it was promulgated in the prior season, where it was highly self-indulgent. No, um, I'm against sort of over displays of materialism for its own sake, but we believe in biblical prosperity and God wants you prosperous because you cannot be a blessing until you are blessed, this king, this og of Bashan must be overcome. You've got to be fruitful before you cross your Jordan, Pastor Thamo said. He also said Bashan means to be a bread giver or one who makes bread, not just so you're a distributor of bread, like helping the poor. I want you to see yourself as a highly resourceful person from tonight. You're not short of ideas. 
God's going to bless you with ideas, uh, maybe even in the business for those of you that do have your own businesses. There's coming a new wisdom for new prosperity. Even if you have a regular job, even if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's, you're going to be prosperous. I declare a new level of fruitfulness over you because this Amorite king has got to be has got to be overrun. Do you know King Og, if you read the account, he had a bed that was two meters by four meters long, made of iron. He was extremely prosperous. If his bed was that big, first king size bed in the Bible, literally. Imagine the size of his room and his palace, his house, etc. Right? Now, don't look at us now. Look at where we are going. I want to quickly just reference Nabal here. The last item on your screen there. Nabal, the fool. The word Nabal means fool. He could not understand who David was. And he refused to honor David by honoring his request for food. He actually said David is a breakaway from Saul. Disrespected David and Jesse in the process. David's dad. He could not see that this David is actually my next king. When you look at the apostolic movement, even now, in the apostolic season and churches in the season, we have been in formation in the past few years. Now we're stepping up into a phase of function. But to do this, God's going to make us fruitful. God's going to make us prosperous. See what we are becoming. Don't, don't, don't foolishly and uh, falsely mislabel what God is doing now. Don't look at David now as a breakaway. Look at him as your next king. Look at where is he going and what he's going to become and how he will operate. And I want to declare over all of you, I, to, I declare this strongly by faith, your poverty days are over. Prosperity days are at hand. We, we, we have to be bakers of bread. We have to be a blessing to all the nations in the earth. And I really believe we're going to see the first fruits of these within our group, breaking forth levels of, of, of need and want that, that imprisoned us previously to new levels of fruitfulness. This is going to be our portion. Look at Deuteronomy 3 verse 1 and 2. Then we turned and we went up the road to Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, came out to meet us in the battle at Edri. But the Lord said to me, do not fear him. I have delivered him and all his people into your hand uh, and his land into your hand. You will do to him just as you've done to Sion, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. God, this is a word, when I read this, I was so fueled. I just felt the presence of the Lord in the room. I was so full with faith. Because God said, I'm going to possess strategy. That's Sion of Heshbon. And God said, I'm going to possess King Og, this prosperity symbol, and Bashan, the place of fruitfulness. And I want you to believe this for your own life. I want you to trust God. For your own life. Look at what God said to Joshua. At the end. Or near the end of Deuteronomy chapter 3. I commanded Joshua at that time saying. Now remember these two kings are dealt with. Under Moses' leadership. Moses now is about to die. Joshua is going to take over. God says to Moses to command Joshua. Your eyes have seen all that the Lord God. Has done to these two kings Joshua. So the Lord shall do to all the kingdoms into which you are about to cross. Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is fighting for you. Now can you see what God did to the two Amorite kings was Joshua's case study for how God's going to deal with all the other kings on the other side of the Jordan. Right? Trust me on this. This is the word for many of you on this call. Soon, God's going to give you a template of victory, standard of victory, for how he will continue to make you victorious, 
victorious in the latter part of a phase of conquest that he has for you. But we're going to see these things happen with speed. We're going to see these things happen extremely quickly. And I want to encourage you all as we, we bring this, this, this summation to a close. I want to encourage you that this is the hour. This is the time. This is the season. It's so ripe. It is so right. Uh, don't, don't be phased by this and that. Uh, You've got to overcome these two Amorite kings. You've got to overcome them. right? But cross your Zarid. Do you not think it's strange, for example, why did Jericho shut up the city? There was a self-imposed siege in Jericho. Not so. Even before Israel attacked them, the Bible says, and I quote the text, now Jericho was tightly shut up. No one could come in and no one could go out. And remember when Joshua sent two spies, what did Rahab the harlot, when she received them, what did she tell them? She said, the men in this city, their hearts quake. There's fear because of you Israelites. Where did Israel establish their reputation as a people of war? Why was Jericho so afraid? Jericho was afraid because of what Israel did in those last two years. 38 years wandering in those last two years, crossing those three rivers, not touching Edom, not touching Ammon, not touching Moab, right? making sure they distance themselves from those mentalities. And then taking these two Amorite kings, right? that reputation or those victories escalated or pushed up Israel's reputation. When they crossed Jordan, they finally did, did to self, rapidly did. They crossed Jordan, and now Jericho is waiting for them. Even before they marched to Jericho, they had won the victory already because Jericho was, empower, was, was absolutely pulverized because of what went on on the other side of the Jordan with the Amorite kings. And I'm saying to you, I don't know how long this period will be for us in the apostolic. For Israel, it was two literal years. I don't think it'll be two literal years, but I'm just, I'm just looking at the next uh, few months, or maybe the next year or two, that you must understand where we are. Don't just live life. Understand the times and the seasons. And go through what you must go through. Be prepared. Because God's going to break every barrier. Specifically when it comes to the matter of prosperity. I believe some of you are going to break through. Because we need, we need to be blessed to be a blessing. This is what God is going to do for every single one of us here that are present on this call and those would, will be watching this broadcast later on. I, I say this to you. This is your portion. I'm, I I have, would have loved to have had a house church meeting today, but we shelved that because I needed to focus on this because this is a word from God. This is the rhema word. When I think about the process, and I think about Pastor Thamo's apostolic wisdom to see this pattern to see this panorama and and to decode it and to to educate the global church into what we are moving into my heart is filled with extreme gratitude for what god has in store for us so with that in mind i want to celebrate the lord's table if you take your bread and your your juice amen take your bread and your juice Amen. I want to pray a simple prayer. We're going to partake and then pray and then we'll end the call. And I want you to mull over the things that we have said this evening. Father, in Jesus' name, as we partake of your body and your blood, 
I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace vested in these emblems. As we remember them, we remember your body and your blood and we partake of these and we receive grace, long life, strength, health. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's receive. Amen. This video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel if you would ever would like to rehearse the concepts. I'm going to encourage you to track the series uh, that Pastor will release week on week here after. Because there's significant grace attached to it. Amen. And this these PDF slides will be sent to you uh, after this meeting. But thank you, everyone, for coming on. May you be encouraged. May you be enthused. And may you see the results of this word coming to pass within your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great grace and abundant peace to you all. Have a great night. The Lord richly bless you. Amen. Amen.